Well, I'm glad you're here. I hope you've come expecting good and wonderful things because God is good and wonderful and God's love is reaching out to each and every person here today. Welcome to worship. Let us come and praise the Lord. Will you join me in our call to worship? 
In the beginning, God. At the end, God. God is our refuge, our friend, our partner, our savior. us sing our faith as we stand together singing hymn number 566, O God, our help in ages past. pray together the prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Gracious and all-loving God, you call us across deep waters and dark places. Yours is the light which guides us and the voice which we follow. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us as we worship you. May those without hope be encouraged those who are sad, cheered. Those who are seeking, find you. And may all things be according to your will. In the name of your beloved Son, we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children gathered here today to join me on the chancel steps. How is everybody? Reagan, come on back. It's good to see you guys. Reagan's all grown up. All right. Leo and Ben and Maya Hessick, come on down. All right. How is everybody? Did you enjoy the snow this week? Yeah? Did you, anybody play in it? Y'all didn't play in it, did you? You didn't play in the snow. You did? You, did, you played in the snow? No. You, you did what? A family snowman? The giantest snowman ever? You made a snowman? You made a fort? Yeah, we, we, made, we had a snowball fight. A snowball fight? Who won? Um, well, we, we made a base. Oh, you made a base, yeah? yeah. You should say yeah. girls won. No. <laughs> yeah? Did, it, did anybody go sledding? Yes, we went sledding. 
S sledding? Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, I went sledding. You know what I did. I know what you did. Yeah, while I was with you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, um, a hill on a big mountain. Yeah. Sweet. You know we went sledding. I know you went. So I saw you out there, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you went sledding on the golf course. Sweet. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Yeah, a little bit. What have you been watching? Hockey, yeah. What else? The skeleton run? Yeah, anybody else watch some of the Olympics? Some hockey. The skeleton run? Well, it's kind of like sledding, I'd say. Well, you know, I've gotten... Uh, yes, Leo? <laughs> Figure skating? Mm -hmm. Leo? Leo? You went to Gatlinburg. Get out of town. Okay. Well, um, I've been watching the Olympics. I've been pretty inspired. I watched the luge. You might know what the luge is. It's like they get this thing and they go down a mountain. It's like sledding. And I've gotten so inspired. Shh. <laughs> I've been so inspired. I decided I'm going to start training for the Olympics. I want to be a luger. I've been doing some training. Y'all believe me? I've got video. I've got video. I've got video to prove it. I've got the, I'm training for the luge. I want to be an Olympian. Let's watch my, me training for the luge. Watch. <laughs> that was pretty ugly. <laughs> so that, that's me training for the luge to be an Olympian. You were training. <laughs> we were sledding. So what do you think? You think I'll be an Olympian one day? No. No? <laughs> well, why not? Why don't you think I'll be an Olympian? I fell off on the first try. <laughs> why don't? Why else don't you think I'll be an Olympian? Shh. I got you very excited today, didn't I? Why? What do you think I'll need to do to improve my form? You need to not fall off. I need to not fall off. That would be a first step. my microphone Ben here you can have my microphone you can <laughs> so okay okay listen okay everybody take a deep breath I've gotten you very excited what else do I need to do to be an Olympian practice yeah anything else what else what do you think Logan what do I need to do to train up to be an Olympian what be to be careful I should be careful well you know when we're trying to be an Olympic athlete in the God's Olympics you know what God's Olympics are right in being a good person, in loving God and being kind to our neighbor and kind to our brothers and sisters and things like that. You know what we've got to do? We've got to work hard. We've got to train. We've got to practice. Every day we've got to practice doing what God wants us to do to be in God's Olympics. But you know what? There's a secret weapon. You know what that secret weapon is? Love. Lo love is a good guess. I was going to say power. God gives us power to do what God wants us to do. So let's pray that God can give us the power to do what God wants us to do in God's Olympics, okay? Let's pray together. Repeat after me, okay? Dear Lord, thank you for snow to play in and friends to have fun with. And we ask you, Lord, to help us work hard and train hard for your Olympics. Give us the power to do what you want us to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. These are the words of Moses. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands, his degrees, and his laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods, and to worship them. I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. 
You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth to witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of the Lord. take our joys and concerns to God together in prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come, how grateful we are to find ourselves in your presence this morning. How it makes us rejoice to think about the goodness with which you have filled our lives, to think about the purpose toward which you have focused our lives, and to think about the ways in which you want to use us to change your world for the better. We give thanks, Father, that today you have a vision for our world, and we pray for wisdom to discern your vision, and for the energy and the hope to carry out that vision to make the world a better place. We come today, Father, and we remember with joy the beautiful life of Vern Hall, and we pray for his family and friends in their time of mourning this day, and we ask that you grant them strength and comfort and peace in the days ahead. We come today and we pray for Kathleen and ask that you would grant her what she needs in her time of need. We recognize today, Father, that there are those throughout the world who are dealing with problems greater than we can imagine. And we pray that you would provide for them what they need in their time of need. In this month, Father, when we celebrate our partnership with the Child Advocacy Center, we pray for the important work that they do in the lives of abused children. We ask that you would grant healing and hope to those children. We ask that you would grant strength and vision to the continuing work of the Child Advocacy Center. We bring these things to you and pray as Christ taught us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
is from 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting as mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? For after all, is a, what is Apollos and what is Paul? They are only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything special, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are all God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Thanks be to God. You know, there are some songs that never, never made the hymnal. Poisoning Pigeons in the Park. Never made it. The Vatican Rag. That someone reminded me this morning has that wonderful verse 2468, it's time to transubstantiate. Never made it. Didn't get in. And neither did National Brotherhood Week. Can you believe National Brotherhood Week didn't make it into the hymnal? These hymns were the creation of a brilliant songwriter by the name of Tom Lehrer. Some call him a comedian. Others say he is a social commentator. Actually, Tom is retired now, 85 years old. But back in the 1960s, Tom Lehrer became rather famous for his offbeat, irreverent, and usually very satirical songs. National Brotherhood Week is a good example. In the first verse, he takes on racial discord, pointing out the sad reality of racism in our society, but then reminding us that on National Brotherhood Week, we can just pretend it doesn't exist. It's a parody loaded with sarcasm. The next verse takes on income inequality, which seems to be all the rage these days. It goes like this. Oh, the poor folks hate the rich folks, and the rich folks hate the poor folks, and my folks hate all your folks. It's as American as apple pie. But during National Brotherhood Week, we should step up and shake the hand of someone you can't stand. You can tolerate him if you try. And then Tom Lehrer brings up religion. And Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to say. Oh, the Protestants hate the Catholics, and the Catholics hate the Protestants, and the Hindus hate the Muslims, and everybody hates the Jews. Mind you, Tom Lehrer is Jewish. And he concludes by saying, but during National Brotherhood Week, National Brotherhood Week, it's National Everyone Smile at One Another Hood Week. Be nice to people who are inferior to you. If only for a week, you have no fear. Be grateful it doesn't last all year. Never made the hymnal. Nope. We get blessed be the tie that binds, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, but National Brotherhood Week never made it. Maybe because it's just too true. If you ask most Christian people what their favorite verse of Scripture is in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, they'll right away say 1 Corinthians 13, that wonderful chapter about love. You know the one I'm talking about. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. 
Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. The most beautiful, powerful, exhaustive description of love in all of literature. Why do you suppose Paul had to tell these Corinthians about this kind of love? Because they hated each other's guts, that's why. In fact, the reason Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth is because it was tearing itself apart with jealousies and quarrels and divisiveness. Some people in that church thought they were all that spiritually, because they spoke in tongues and they could quote scripture frontward and backward and they looked down on everybody who couldn't. There were some who propped themselves up as amateur theologians, which by the way is one of the continuing problems in churches today. And so they argued back and forth about who had the correct view of the resurrection, the correct view about the cross, and the correct understanding of the nature of sin. And they picked favorites from among their preachers. Imagine that. The big divide was between Paul and a fellow by the name of Apollos, who was said to be a silver-tongued preacher who people just loved to listen to while Paul was kind of erudite and academic. I only only go to church when Apollos is preaching, says one member of that church. Yeah, well, says another, when Apollos is in the pulpit, I go over to the Baptist church. If you ever want to see a case study in church strife, take a look at 1 Corinthians. It's a letter intended to help a congregation come to grips with the problem of divisiveness. But more importantly, it is a letter that seeks to help people learn how to celebrate and embrace differences. Churches, like the world itself, are not made to be homogeneous. Difference is built into us. None of us is exactly the same as someone else, even identical twins. I didn't know that until I read an article recently about how the latest research shows that although identical twin embryos share the same DNA, during early fetal development they undergo more than 300 genetic mutations. More than 300. And as human cells divide trillions of times during a lifetime, a few hundred genetic mutations could lead over the years to millions or even trillions of genetic differences in the DNA of identical twins. That's what the latest genetic research shows. God has wired difference into all of us. And yet we don't quite seem to know what to do with it and how to handle these differences without building barriers and mistrust and animosity between each other. Whites and blacks, poor and rich, Protestant, Catholic, Muslim, Hindu, Jew, and not even an annual National Brotherhood Week can make it better. What can? The power of God. I was thinking about this when I remembered something our church member Don Tate said during a presentation he made during our Imagine campaign. Maybe you remember it. Don mentioned that as a banker, he would have had a hard time being one of the early disciples of Jesus. When Jesus said, feed these 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, Don says he would have gotten out his banker's calculator and figured out how many ounces are in a loaf of bread and how many people that would feed and then gone back to Jesus and said, Lord, we might be able to feed 50 people, but not 5,000. There's no way. But Jesus would say, just trust me, Don. Go and do it. And so in Don's imaginary journey, he'd go out and start feeding 
people. And lo and behold, when he was done, all 5,000 men plus women and children were fed and were full and happy, and they collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers besides. And then Don said something like this. You see, the problem with my banker's calculator is that it doesn't have a times the power of God button on it. I like that. Times the power of God. There are some things we can't do. And there are some things only God can do. And here's what Paul tells the Corinthians. What is Apollos? What is Paul? We are simply servants through whom you came to believe. I sowed the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And then he says that they, the Corinthian church people, are God's field each one of them a different kind of plant or flower in that field. And as some of us plant seeds and others of us water the seeds, God causes the field to grow and become productive. We all have a part in it, but it is God who gives the growth by weaving together all the differences and making that field beautiful in his time. Think of it this way. God has planted in each and every person, each and every one of you here today, a small part of the puzzle of life. And even as we sit in this sanctuary today, God is at work putting all these puzzle pieces together into what will one day blossom into the kingdom of heaven. So we've got to stop the sin of division and discord and fighting against the very thing God is trying to accomplish. We've got to learn to appreciate our differences and start using the times pow the power of God button in our lives. Many years ago, I was honored to serve as a delegate to the General Synod of my home denomination. What an amazing thing it is when thousands of people from all over the world come together and worship and fellowship and fight. Oh yeah, there was lots of fighting. And most of it had to do with sex. That's what denominations love to do these days. Get together to fight about sex. Well, I went to that general synod pretty much convinced that the faction that was pressing a more liberalized agenda about sexual ethics was made up of a bunch of perverts, outlaws, and heretics. To me, the Bible clearly spoke to all these issues, and there was no need to discuss it further. The Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, as some like to say. So I went out to Synod to save these poor misguided souls from themselves. But I made two mistakes. First, I got to know some of them. And I discovered that the words pervert, outlaw, and heretic didn't do them justice. Nor did those pejorative words describe them accurately. Why, some were little old grandmothers struggling with the fact that they'd been widowed, but now miraculously had found new love but if they remarried, they lose the pensions they and their late spouses had worked so hard to earn. And now their kids were all shook up that they were thinking about just shacking up. And the worst thing is, is that their kids, most of whom don't even go to church anymore, were quoting the Bible against them. And there are others there too, people who are struggling with their own individual issues to find a just sexual ethic for living as Christians in the 20th century. Well, that was my first mistake, getting to know them as people and not labels. The second mistake I made was attending workshops where serious study of the Bible was being done. And I learned I didn't know as much about the Bible as I thought I did. You know, people today talk an awful lot about biblical marriage. They say biblical marriage is between one man and one woman. Not true. 
Biblical marriage is more often between one man and as many women as he darn well pleases to have. Not to mention a side order of concubines. Biblical marriage was usually an arranged marriage, and girls were married off as soon as they hit puberty and could bear children, usually about 12 or 13 years of age. And I don't know about you, but I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, I learned a lot about what I didn't know but thought I did. And I can't say that anything was really settled at that synod except for this. Those grandmothers and other strugglers and I left that synod somehow united as the people of God. We didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but we understood each other better. And we were all committed to learning and growing as Christians. And we also left that synod committing, committed to seeking justice for all people everywhere. In short, we loved each other. Love is patient, kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. Love does not rejoice at the wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This love that Paul writes about is the times, the power of God button that you and I need to activate in our lives. And this is how it can work for you when you go out today to live in this world of many differences. Just a suggestion. Go and become friends with someone who is not like you. Commit yourself to learning about them and come to understand why they see and live life differently than you do. And just love them. Love them unconditionally, trusting that God is at work taking all our differences and miraculously weaving them into the beautiful kingdom of heaven. You are God's field, and God is making us grow. Amen.
join me in the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, make me, even me, an instrument of your peace. Amen. Brothers and sisters, do you have the Spirit of God within you? If so, then you've got the power. So go in the power to heal, the power to hope, the power to love. Amen. Amen.